Lovely. I think that's all from me. Um, over to you, Jeremy. Well, thank you, Evie. Um, I'll just open up the presentation. And open it. That should enlarge. Well, thank you again, and good evening, everyone. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is um, mainly about the large blue butterfly and uh, my involvement with it uh, over over fifty years now. <clears throat> but to start with, I'll just. Um, give a little bit of background of where I've, I've come in. Um, I've been very, very fortunate. I was actually an undergraduate in reading zoology in Cambridge many years ago. And I've been very fortunate in being able to study butterfly ecology and conservation all my career. And my work has really divided into two bits for a little bit, for about 20% of it, about a fifth, I've, be, I've spent analyzing the causes of decline and trying to and developing methodology to uh, measure what was actually happening to them in the first place. And secondly, uh, my main work has been to try and understand the drivers of decline, because up to the 1980s, mid 80s, late 80s, there was actually no example in the world of the, a successful conservation of a butterfly anywhere. That is a deliberate one that hadn't been uh, conserved just because a, a wood or something had been set aside. Um, so uh, why choose butterflies for conservation, apart from being interested in them in the first place? They make very good uh, model studies, um, partly because they're the most uh, best known, uh, best understood insects, and insects uh, react very quickly to environmental change. So um, quite early on, uh, it was clear that butterfly declines were an order of magnitude greater than birds and plants across the UKs. A little about the same time, it became clear when we looked at it that butterflies were representative of other terrestrial invertebrates. And in fact, uh, freshwater ones were doing slightly worse. Um, most worrying of all, from uh, the early 80s, it became clear when I looked at the patterns of change that actually there were as many extinctions on nature reserves, PA stands for protected areas, as ordinary unprotected areas, ordinary commercial woods and farmland. And in a few cases, the extinction rate was actually higher on nature reserves. Uh, and after all that gloomy background, um, eventually, eventually, as we began to understand the processes that were driving declines, which in a nutshell can be oversimplified in, into two types. Um, first of all, it turned out as we looked at almost every species we looked at, the um, niche occupied by the larva was much more specialized than anyone had thought, even for the common species. And um, these, usually they just exploited a very small minority of their um, uh, food plants growing in a certain, uh, a certain way. Uh, and um, secondly, uh, the adults were much more sedentary than anyone had uh, believed. 30, 40 years ago. So armed with this knowledge and based actually on the, mainly on the research done on the large blue, which I'll come to in a moment, um, we were at least able to turn around four other species that were projected to go extinct in the UK by uh, about the year uh, extinction. That's just extrapolating their trends. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about them. I'm going to talk about the one that got away, the, 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 the failure initially that was uh, later reasonably successful, uh, which is the large blue butterfly. Now, large blues are um, considered iconic species um, for three attributes. One is they're um, undeniably beautiful as adults. The second is that they uh, have a uh, extremely specialized life cycle, which I'll come to in a moment. And thirdly, 
there are, there are five European species of large blue, of which we have one, Maculinia arian, the large blue, and all of them are, are endangered species. Uh, the, large, the large blue is, is, to my knowledge, the only British insect that is uh, rated as globally endangered and certainly endangered in Europe. And so those three attributes sort of raise the large blue to a, a sort of uh, iconic status among butterfly people and conservationists uh, over, over, over a century. Um, so I'll just quickly go over the life cycle because it's to, at the heart of its conservation. The females lay their eggs on the flower buds of wild thyme and do note in passing where my uh, pointer is, she's laying on a, a, a flower bud in tight bud. Um, they don't lay once the um, flowers are out or on the very, very young buds. Then they feed on the thyme flowers and developing seed for about um, three weeks or so. And they very quickly go through all their skin molds to the final instar, but they, they, they put on very little growth uh, unlike uh, normal caterpillars, but they develop very quickly. They develop antitractive organs by the final instar. So after about three weeks, when they're still only about 1% of the final body weight, they're in their final instar, final molt, they drop off the food plant, and they're sooner or later found by a red ant, a Myrmica species of ant, if there's one present, which um, goes through then a very complex adoption process, which I'll show a video clip of in a moment. And they are, they are mimicking the ant's own grubs and they're carried into the ant's nest where they live for the next uh, 10 or 11 months, feeding, in this case, on ant grubs. Well, the large blue is always, as I said, attracted great attention and concern because of its great rarity, it was a great prize, a prize matched only by the large copper among Victorian butterfly collectors and Edwardian ones. And um, so it was uh, a lot of attention came to it, but it was always noted with a very few periods of um, short lived expansion. It was in, in decline on the hundred or so sites it's been recorded on from, from Britain. And that decline accelerated um, after the 1960s down to almost nothing, as you can see here. And for the first 100 and uh, whatever it was, 20 years or so, there were many conservation efforts because it was regarded as such a special species, but they were all based on educated guesses. Then in 1972, when everything had failed, I was, um, I was actually taken off my PhD and asked to go down to the West Country and study the last tiny population of large blues, just a handful of uh, individuals, to see if we were missing something in our knowledge about its biology that it needed. Then there were various um, phases of testing restoration. And the research knowledge came alas too late to save the last colony, which as I say, was down to uh, single figures uh, in these last few years uh, of adults. Um, but it did actually unfold, uh, open the book as to what was needed. And so we reintroduced it from Sweden, of which more and on, and, and here's the position we are now. Not all these are, are standalone colonies. They're, um, they're satellites of metapopulations, but they certainly count in historical terms as colonies. And there are now probably um, as many colonies in the UK as there were in the uh, 1800s. And um, we have the two largest known colonies in uh, Europe of this globally endangered species, and for all we know the world, or, although there are bound to be some bigger ones. So let's go back to the um, early days when I started off. The great puzzle with the large blue, and the puzzle for many species of butterflies that were declining, for as I said earlier, there'd been actually no successful targeted attempt um, that succeeded uh, to, to conserve any butterfly up till then. Um, the great puzzle was 
why was it declining on nature reserves and other sites when its known resources appeared to be as abundant as ever? This is a site um, a year or two after extinction in Cornwall, and there was much time and um, red ants um, all over the place. So the premise was for uh, 130 years or so that um, the habitat was fine uh, for large blues, but there must be some other, um, other reason. And um, the obvious one was to blame butterfly collectors. People used to take their whole holidays uh, in the days when transport was uh, less accessible than now and go down to the West Country or the Cotswolds for two or three weeks and camp on sites and just spend the whole time uh, collecting large blues. So thousands were caught and there are many, many, many ones in, in the UK museums. Uh, and so that was a that was a, a, a sensible, educated guess, uh, and it led, unfortunately, in the 1920s to the second best site in the UK being bought as a nature reserve, and a big fence being put round it. it was warden collectors were kept off, and within about uh, five years, that colony and that colony alone, alas, had gone extinct because the reason was it wasn't collectors doing the damage, it was a, a, a subtle change in the management of the site. And it was, in this case, it was killed by kindness uh, and the normal grazing animals were also excluded along with the collectors and uh, uh, everything went pear-shaped. So in the early seventies, I was, as I said, drafted down to study the population dynamics of the last colony in the UK, which was tiny. And I, I basically lived with it for six months of the year, um, <clears throat> measuring anything, everything, how many eggs were laid, how, how did, how many eggs hatched, what was killing the ones that didn't, how, how well did they survive on time, which ants did they go into, um, uh, because it turned out there were five species of, it was already known or, or thought that only red ants, Myrmica species, were suitable as hosts for this butterfly, but there were up to five, there were five species on this last site, and they all took the caterpillars in, then what was killing them in ants' nests, uh, and so on and so forth. Were they dispersing? What was uh, affecting the number of eggs laid? So um, I did this year after year, measuring and comparing different parts of the survival in different parts of the site. site. And I found about 28 different factors that were either affecting uh, egg laying, dispersal, or, or particularly survival. But when you uh, modeled it, when you boiled down, there were actually only about five or six that mattered. Um, and so I was able to construct a very simple uh, uh, mechanistic model um, uh, describing the population dynamics based on six, six factors of which for conservation, by far the most important was this one, because although they were um, adopted by any species of ant that encountered them under the thyme plants on which they'd previously been feeding, they only survived or nearly only survived in one species, Myrmica sabuleti. So here's some real data I collected in the first years and it was really difficult to get. So it took two or three years to get a statistically meaningful sample, even though the pattern was pretty clear from the beginning, but to, to, but to persuade practical conservationists to do different things on nature reserves, you actually have to have a very good case um, but here, here's, here's the sort of data I eventually got showing uh, about 10 times higher survival with Myrmica sabuleti than any other species of red ant. And if you put that into the model, this is just one example um, of, a, of a theoretical site starting with 23 adults, which is roughly a thousand eggs in four hectares with 100% Myrmica sabuleti at a certain density and a certain fitness, worker weight and so on, you'd get it stabilizing as this model predicted at about um, 3000 uh, eggs or so. But if it was only two thirds Myrmica sabuleti and a third, another species, Myrmica scabrinodis, um, 
then the value of lam lambda, the intrinsic rate of uh, increase, was exactly level. Uh, think R numbers, it's not quite the same as R numbers in COVID, but it's, it's not dissimilar. And if it was only Scabrinodis on the site, um, the survival rate was so low that um, extinction was inevitable within five or six years, starting with that initial number. So that gave us a bit of a clue, but um, before I get on to the practical conservation, um, I was lucky enough also in the uh, 1980s and onwards to be able to extend the work um, to the other four species of uh, Maculinia on the continent of Europe. And um, I thought I'd just introduce you to the other species. They're all endangered in different, different places. Um, sorry, I'll just go back one. And it turned out there were two types of lifestyle within the genus. Um, there was our species, the large blue, which actually is the most primitive form of, of lifestyle where once it's in the ant's nest, it just feeds on ant grubs. Uh, this is a very inefficient way of, of exploiting the resources inside an ant's nest. Uh, you only ever get one or two butterflies per nest. Um, it destroys the host colony. And, and nevertheless, to survive in a Myrmica sabulici nest and not be torn to pieces and by the ants and fed to the uh, ant grubs themselves, you have to have a, a very close uh, mimicry of the ants, uh, which I'll describe in a moment. Whereas the so-called cuckoo species, we, we called them of large blue, have a, a very different lifestyle once they're in the nest. They actually persuade the, the ants to regurgitate food and feed them directly in preference to their own ant grubs, in fact. So this is a very efficient way of feeding because the ants are collecting food in the wild and instead of feeding them to their ant grubs, which the caterpillar then eats, they're feeding them, they're jumping a link in the food chain and they're feeding them direct to the uh, ant grub. And so you get roughly 10 times as many caterpillar uh, um, butterflies emerging from a comparable sized uh, ant nest as with the uh, predatory species of large blue and it only weakens the host colony as a rule but it does mean the mimicry has to be almost spot on for them to be able to survive in the first place and as i looked at the uh, host uh, at what which species were using which ants across Europe with a colleague of mine, um, Graham Elms, in the 1980s, we got this very clear cut pattern that each species of Maculinia was um, pretty well dependent on a single and different species of Myrmica ant. Now, uh, that seemed too good to be true. And in fact, of course it was. And as we uh, the work expanded to Eastern Europe, it turned out that there were some host shifts. But over, over in Western Europe, this holds, and uh, there are one or two parts uh, in the Eastern half of Europe where the ant that's exploited changes, but they're still only using one ant. And the way they achieve this is, um, is twofold, we eventually found out. We assumed from the first that they were mimicking the ants chemically because the way ants recognize each other, Myrmica ants recognize each other and tell their own nest mates apart from other, other um, nests of the same species and certainly from other species of Myrmica is in a cocktail of hydrocarbons that they secrete on the surface and they touch each other and it feeds through the, and it spreads through the colony. Um, this particular uh, cocktail. So here's the model at the bottom, and this is um, this is the cocktail for this particular species of ant, which is Myrmica ruginodis, of different hydrocarbons. Not only different types of hydrocarbons, but in a, a specific uh, concentration of different hydrocarbons. So when the caterpillar, in this case Maculinia alcon, is feeding on its food plant coming up for its final molt, it doesn't, it, it's, its chemicals on its body have no relation to the ant. But the moment it does its last um, molt, still on the food plant and it drops to the ground, it has a very simple 
mimetic pattern, which actually is not good enough for any worker ant of any species to distinguish it. Workers can't distinguish even if you put ant grubs of different species of, of ant out there, the workers will adopt, will will pick them up if they're of the same genus. And it's only when they get into the nests that the much more discriminatory nurse ants here um, sift them out and kill any uh, perceived foreigner. So once they get into the nest, and if they detect it's the host species to which they're adapted, they then secrete an, an additional suite of chemicals, which um, very closely uh, um, mimics the uh, model close enough to survive. Uh, and uh, quite a bit of this work was done uh, with uh, Carsten Schoenreger, David Nash in Copenhagen did some. And, and the first breakthrough we had was with uh, a terrific postdoc, uh, Toshiba Akino from Japan, who came over for a couple of years. So chemical mimicry in all the maculinia gets them accepted once they're in the nest as a member of the nest. But the more I watched them, the more it was a clear that there was something different going on with their behavior. And it took a long time because they were, they were clearly being treated on occasions as if they were queen ants in the nests. Um, which are sort of the supreme uh, individual that the ants will die for to kill and kill to, to save. And um, the only likely clue was acoustical on top of it. So chemical mimicry gets them in the nest and sure enough, it took about 15 years before we could afford to get the kit to measure it. And then I also had a very good uh, um, PhD student from Turin, Francesca Barbaro, and we did these experiments together. First of all, we recorded the ants, uh, benign ants in the, in the lab working, uh, uh, behaving fairly normally. And the first thing we found, which was unknown in ant biology, um, was that the queen ants were making different sounds from the workers and the larvae, the ant grubs were mute. They couldn't make sound at all. And then, so when we played the sounds back through little mics um, uh, to uh, lab colonies of ants, uh, the queen ant sounds, the ants just gathered around and sort of stood around the little mic and, um, uh, protected them. Then we found amazingly that the, um, the chrysalis and the caterpillar were making these sounds too, and they were mimicking the queens in three important attributes. Um, and when we played them back, they were actually close closer to the queens and they were protected in as if they were queen ants. So what the story is, we understand it now, is they use chemicals to get into the nest and acoustical mimicry once they've been accepted as a nest mate to elevate their status inside the nest. So, right, back to a bit of ecology and conservation. What this means, this host specificity, which had not been realized um, by the early people who were trying to conserve this butterfly, was that instead of being able to survive with any species of ant, um, they were dependent on um, one species of ant. In the case of the UK large blue species uh, with Myrmica sabuleti. And this meant the ants themselves have very narrow niches in, um, in grassland. So whereas the food plant thyme grows in shortish turf up to about 20 centimeters tall, different species of ants take over as it gets um, shorter and hotter. And because the um, Myrmica sabuleti is in the shortest grass and because high densities are needed, the peak of this curve, um, the niche of the large blue, here, Latin name Maculinia arian, is very narrow indeed. Uh, it's roughly turf that's one to three centimeters tall. And the reason is um, there's nothing magic about the turf height, but it's it's how much it's shading the um, the heat of the sun. Uh, this this is a shot of a, a British large blue site in the year it went extinct, and um, it looks pretty hom uh, homogeneous to uh, human eyes. But if you're the size of an ant, it's very very varied, and um, 
the longest turf of about um, in spring and autumn, the soil where the ant nests are, uh, when these measurements were made was about um, 17 degrees centigrade and the shortest parts that were one centimeters tall were about seven degrees centigrade warmer in spring and autumn, which is when Myrmica sabuleti needs <coughs> much more warmth than other species of Myrmica ant that live in the UK. And sure enough, when I looked at, um, here's some real data on ant niches and Myrmica sabuleti on turf height of all the sites I could find, all the ones that had gone extinct, which were these ones, had, had turf that was much too tall and very low densities of Myrmica sabuleti, if at all. And this at last seemed to explain why the large blue had gone extinct from so many sites, including nature reserves. Agriculture had changed hugely. The flatter areas that were once pastoral uh, farming with shepherds had been uh, intensified for agriculture, leaving the valleys where they always were restricted to, um, to be abandoned. And they grew tall and the ants disappeared and the butterflies with it. So we then moved on to what I call the testing phase of this um, uh, program, which has lasted 50 years now, um, to see this was too late, alas, to save the large blue um, from its final colony going, but it seemed worth trying to see if we could, if the ideas were right, to see if we could restore this habitat. So um, on the acid soils, the scrub need burning back, and then we grazed it quite tight in spring and autumn, which is a form of uneconomical farming. And sure enough, the Myrmica sabuleti uh, uh, ants came back very, very rapidly. So then David Semcox, who's now the project officer for the last 20, 22, 23 plus years, uh, and I went over to Sweden, which is another story, to find a race of large blue that was both similar to the UK and which we were allowed to take and, and, and introduce into the uh, UK to test if these ideas were right. And there were really two questions I had then. Will the emergence of Swedish ones match the time, the phenology of time, and will the caterpillars survive as well as the former UK genotypes um, used to with UK ants. And so under Q1, we knew already, I had found in the early days, that the butterflies were very, very picky about which flowers they would, time flowers they'd lay on. There's a very narrow window of time in tight bud. If it's too young, they reject it. If it's too old, they reject it. And this stage only lasts a day or two or three for any, any time and flower. And so it's a narrow window and a minority of plants are in that condition. And in, this is rather complicated, so I'll only point out here, in Sweden, they actually emerge much later in um, mid-July to August. So when we brought them to the UK, would they emerge early enough to use UK time? And Sure enough, they did. Uh, we could hardly believe it. So here's the um, timing of the old UK race on this, these particular sites on Dartmoor. And here they are in the first three years when we introduced them to the sites. The other question was, would the colonies survive well enough uh, to, um, to uh, with under British conditions? Uh, and so we tested this on a number of sites. This is our longest running one um, that I use as an example. And first of all, we got the capacity of the site from being theoretically completely unsuitable for the butterfly up to what my model predicted to support about 120,000 eggs. The carrying capacity was raised that. And this is what the model predicted would happen if we put in the number of um, butterflies we did introduce in 19 in the early 1990s each year, if we'd known in advance what the weather was going to be because droughts always to cause a decline and um, what the habitat management, how successful they were in hitting the spot that we, the sweet spot that um, we were asking. Um, and 
that's what's happened over 30 generations without any extra ones being uh, put in, uh, which uh, has, has been very pleasing indeed. Uh, and just to carry on with this site, Greendown, which now supports the largest known colony of large blues in Europe. This was photographed uh, only yesterday. Uh, and this is this egg we're rather pleased with because it represents the 30th generation since they were introduced to, the, to this, this part of um, uh, the UK. So, but to go back long before that, this was, uh, the early results were sufficiently um, uh, promising for a consortium of conservation bodies to uh, manage former sites. We've got about a hundred sites under some form of so-called large blue management. Um, and as I said earlier, since the uh, late 1990s, the practical work has been led um, by, and, and the uh, advice has been uh, led by David Simcox, very ably helped uh, for the last 12 years by Sarah Meredith. Um, whereas I've, I've, I've done quite a bit, but I've stuck mainly to the science. Uh, I handed the baton on and they've been very successful. So we have two types of restoration going on. Um, most involve uh, targeted grazing of abandoned sites. But the ultimate test was to see if we could recreate or create from scratch new large blue habitat um, in, uh, we've got about seven examples now, starting with arable fields or, or construction such as this railway construction uh, or, or, or where um, conifer plantations on former limestone grassland had failed. So here's one of the examples uh, David and I designed in 2004 um, and um, that the red is what happened with the ants and the large blue colonized very quickly. It was very close to another colon, to green down. Here's another site that David uh, um, designed um, a, a couple of years later on the same uh, main Paddington to uh, Paddington line. Um, and um, here's the, the construction. Um, obviously the engineers did the basic work, but we, as it were, were allowed to um, play or modify the, the micro topography and spray on uh, a, a, a seed mix of local, local plants. And sure enough, uh, a little later on, it was supporting a lot of spe desirable species, including a rather small, in this case, colony of large blues. Now, um, the Cotswolds, uh, so the Somerset, Somerset went very well indeed, and we've got a string of colonies there, in, including um, two, two large ones. The Cotswolds was much more of a challenge, but um, we have at last been able to um, uh, establish it on, first of all, on Daneway Banks, the uh, Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust and Royal Entomological Society's uh, beautiful reserve in the Cotswolds. And in the last two or three years on, um, we're, we're beginning a big push now to try and get it across the Cotswolds, which uh, to its former stronghold there. Uh, so here is uh, its classic site of Rodborough from which it went extinct about 150 years ago. And it started, um, and it was flying there in good numbers the last two years, and it's just out there again. So here we are, um, 50 years on, uh, numbers go up and down. This isn't on a log scale, uh, and these are drought. These are drought years. These two things. This was a freakishly good year for weather, and I think it's going to stabilise somewhere around here this year, as we had more, uh, but gradually creep up as we had more and more sites. Now, if I've got two minutes, uh, is that okay, Evie? Um, I will show three or four slides. Um, on some of the wider lessons. First of all, Grand Elms and I estimate that there are probably about 10,000 other species of insect, not, not many of them butterflies that have this sort of lifestyle. That is more species um, than, than birds in the world. Uh, and um, pretty well all of them because of their life cycle, uh, 
the cycle, those that are known are endangered species or severely threatened. And um, certainly this um, type of study has given insights into how we may uh, extend, extend their conservation without doing the incredibly time consuming and expensive research that had to go into the large blue. Secondly, for um, other species of butterfly, particularly silver spotted skipper and Adonis blue that um, we worked on, there were, there were about four other species that were on trajectories, uh, not, you couldn't say they're gonna become extinct by the millennium, but they were suggesting it. They were, if you just extrapolated their trends in the UK, uh, they got down to naught about the year 2000. Uh, but using the lessons from the large blue study, we were able to make many shortcuts with the Adonis blue, silver spot escaper. Um, David Sincox was a, a major um, person doing this work as well. Uh, and um, we were able to apply, to advise um, the then Nature Conservancy Council, DEFRA now, all these people, get it into agri-environmental schemes and turn those species down. Um, the Adonis blue was down to about 30 colonies in the country when that happened. And they're now two of the most rapid. So, so that, was, um, that was actually uh, almost the most useful lesson from the large blue story that we could actually just quickly jump the long study, look at the larval niche. Is it very specialized, much more specialized than one had thought previously? Yes, it was in every case. Uh, let's try and um, get this uh, niche more abundant in its former sites. And sure enough, uh, uh, the populations respond very, very quickly. Uh, and finally, perhaps the most important thing of all, um, going back to large blues, we'd have never have got the major partners, the National Trust, the Wildlife Trusts, and so on, who actually own the sites and manage the sites to our specifications to uh, go, th go through this um, quite intricate process of management if, we, if we, it wasn't beneficial for other species. One of the ha happiest uh, things that turned out when we started um, restoring habitat so-called large blue management is how many other rarities, declining species, suddenly uh, increased as well. And here are, here are four of them on three sites on the edge of Dartmoor. Some of our most endangered butterflies now actually, pearl border fritillary and high brown fritillary. And here's what happened. This is on a log scale. Uh, this is what happened nationally over this period on a log scale. So they were down to about 10% of numbers, uh, the high brown and the pearl bordered. And that's on the sites that didn't go extinct in the first place, about um, uh, 18, 90% of the colonies went extinct. And these were the surviving colonies. But on a log scale, when we managed for, these are just three sites for the large blue, lo and behold, the um, fritillaries which were there in small numbers on two of them increased, ditto the grayling and so on. Um, and the reason was that we were reestablishing a, a missing type of habitat into grasslands that had gone because agricultural practices had changed. And that's true over the whole of the Northern half of, of Europe. And so when we come to uh, calcareous sites, the previous ones were on acid soils. We've had a similar story, which we're monitoring at the moment. Lovely things like the shrill cardaby, the small blue, the second um, rarest uh, blue in the UK is on, on most of our sites uh, in, in Somerset and the Cotswold. Donis blue is spreading this very rare um, uh, uh, bee fly down in Villa the fascinating rugged oil beetle, and some lovely flowers as well, rare flowers, all, all red data book species. So I shall end then um, and just end with a slide. Many, many, many people have helped uh, me personally and with the work, uh, both the science and the, the application of the science along the way. Uh, and uh, here are just a very few of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. What an incredible talk and a very uplifting story and a really nice one to end on, I think.
Um, I have a question for you, actually. Um, yeah. You mentioned how conservation science can be applied to other butterflies that um, were having declining abundances. Um, I think there's a couple on your, that list. I, the only one I can remember that I could think of was the clouded yellow and that you could bypass um, some of the research um, methodology by just looking at the larval niches for these for these species. I was just wondering how, um, do you have another example of a different larval niche that you could fulfill with the conservation science? I know you gave a couple of examples on the screen. Yeah, yeah um, um, the two examples I gave on screen were, were very similar to the large blue, just different food plants and different types of, of, of soil. They were early successional um, species that are at the north of their range in the UK and they need warm habitats. Um, but a, a rather different one, if I may um, poach David Simcox and Sarah Meredith's most recent work is the Duke of Burgundy fritillary, which also uses a successional stage in both woodland and um, grassland. And um, it, it, it breeds on cowslips and uh, uh, primroses, and they've been, been measuring the exact niche and um, uh, it's it's a later stage. Uh, it's it's a more complicated one. It likes taller grassland, but you've got to have um, regular disturbances so that the cowslips and primroses seed because they're not very long lived. Um, they're short lived perennials, and then it has to grow up into after two or three years into the sort of big clumps uh, that the the Duke of Burgundy will um, will lay its eggs on, and um, that's that's been a that's been a, a great success. They, their advice in the Cotswold sites, um, I believe, uh, they're having an extremely good year um, because, but thanks to the National Trust putting into practice uh, um, the this type of habitat that's been identified, and um, and elsewhere they they've got it back where where it had gone extinct. So uh, that's just one more example. Yeah. Lovely, that's really insightful. Thank you. You will have to excuse my cold as well. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit snotty. Um, yes, and actually, I was just wondering, you showed us some of those clips. Um, the one I could see was from Netflix. Are you able to talk to us a bit about what those clips are from? Uh, yeah, the, um, the, the one of the um, Elcon Blue, the one that um, had the feeding frenzy uh, fed directly by ants. That was a Netflix film that came out about two years ago and is available. Uh, gosh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was, I think it was just called Grasslands. It was, it was a, it wasn't on the large blues themselves. It was about um, five, six, seven minutes in an hour long film, uh, which included cheetahs and uh you know grassland species uh spectacular grassland species across the world and i think it's just called grasslands uh uh the other one is a film that's being made now in fact they're cutting the rushes uh uh will be as as i speak i think uh by someone called silverback uh, films and um it's projected to be on um uh one of the BBC channels later later this year. And I believe Attenborough is going to be, well, he's lined up to do the commentary uh, if, if, if available, put it like that. Uh, wow, oh, that is incredible. Okay. I, I can't but wait so, for that to come out. So. Yeah. But then again is, is a one on general British, British wildlife. And this will be, I, I don't know how long, a five minute, 10 minutes, but they've got the whole life cycle of, of our, our large blue, which is much, much harder to film than um, the Elcon blue one. Uh, it's, they're very hard to keep in captivity. Mm. Oh, lovely. Okay, well, um, keep an eye out for a David Attenborough um, documentary yeah. on British wildlife, everyone. Yeah. I just I don't know what the film is. I, I don't know what the name is. Is going to be yet? I may have been told, but I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Well, I'm sure we'll see it advertised on our TV. Mm. So, mm. everyone, keep an eye out for that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So, I think all the links have been posted. And you've got our questionnaire um, at the bottom if you'd like to fill that out. As I do say, it does have help give us a bit um, help uh, give us a bit of feedback for which to improve our events in the future. Um, with yeah. So um, okay, I think we're ready for our Q and A session now. 
Um, let me know all your questions in the Q&A chat um, and hopefully we can dive straight in. I think so far we've got a question from got an anonymous sure. sender asking if about the recordings. So um, all of our sessions are being recorded. Um, they're going to be posted on our YouTube channel of which the YouTube channel, um, all of the clips from the YouTube channels will be put into a blog post, which I'll be uploading in the next week or so um, on the Museum of Zoology blog. So if you've missed anything, don't mm -hmm. worry, we've recorded it and you can come back and delve straight in where you started or left. Yeah. So not, yeah. not a problem there. I do think want, we did have, oh, sorry. Sorry, do you want me to read these questions and try and answer them? Uh, or are you going to read them out? What do you, oh, do you, I'll do you read play? them out. You read them out. Okay, yeah. I shall close these questions in that case. And, and no this. problem. Mm. So Roger asks, how did you establish the biochemical signals of the butterfly larvae? And he also <laughs> says, amazing. I'm, I'm sure, um, I think you're referring to the talk as well. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we did it in cap activity with a solvent from the caterpillars and um, then uh, I say we, uh, I didn't actually do this because I'm not a chemist, uh, this uh, uh, Akino, my, my um, Japanese uh, postdoc, uh, is a brilliant chemist. Um, and um, first of all, we identified the chemicals um, by, by just uh, uh, we got solvents and we identified them through a, through a mass spec. And then um, having identified, we did, we did two things. We um, put them on dummies, little, little glass beads with a little bit of um, tissue in them to see if the ants would react to them. And um, sure enough, they did. They actually carried them about. And then the real test, um, was Akino went back to Japan and he synthesized some of these chemicals and sent me um, cocktails, uh, mimetic cocktails, which we put on dummies again and we tested on ants in the labs and they picked them up and they took them to their nest and they behaved uh, as normal. And if you put the wrong uh, cocktail on or that is of a non-host ant, they, they didn't or they attacked it if you put it in the nest. Mm. Okay, wonderful. Mm. Very insightful. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so our next question asks, presumably you have to actively discourage the wrong species of ants, or does the grazing schemes uh, utilised lead to the only the correct mammica ants becoming the most abundant? Yeah, that's a very good question. That, but that's uh, the second part is, is what happens. Uh, it's, if the habitat's right for these ants, uh, it's well nigh impossible. You get uh, on the, on our best sites. We get um, two. They have small nests, smallish nests. We get two, even occasionally three nests per square meter. You know, over a few few hectares, um, and it's in. They 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 leave very quickly if the habitat is unsuitable for them. Within a year or two, usually and get displaced by other species of red ant. But if you then um, get their optimum niche uh, in the grassland, and that's, that's the, the timing that matters is in spring and autumn for Myrmica sabuleti, um, because they need a lot of warmth on their nests. Uh, they don't build ant mounds like the yellow, ant, the yellow meadow ant, Lazius flavus. Um, so they, they need short turf, which um, I showed one slide. It's, it's much warmer in the soil than under taller turf that shades the sun uh, in, in autumn and spring. In summer, when the, when the sun is stronger, um, they do very well in, in taller turf. And that, that allows the flowers, all the flowers to, to bloom and seed and everything. So uh, yeah, the ants come and go very quickly, displacing each other, um, just just in different uh, levels of grazing. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question is, how can I be a zoologist? I am a 12 year old child. Wow, do you have any advice for an aspiring zoologist? Uh, well, um, if you want to do research, uh, it's quite competitive. So uh, you'll need to do uh, study biology at any rate um, at, at A-levels. And 
And um, if you want to do research, you really do need a university degree. Um, uh, in the old days, you didn't, but to get accepted for posts, which are, uh, tend to be quite competitive, uh, uh, you you get less of a it, you really get a look in if you've got a, a, a degree and a, and a good one and and nowadays um, a master's or a PhD is really helpful if you want to do research it's not not the be all and end all but um, but if you tend to graduate with a a, 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 a BA a master uh, um, you uh, you you're more likely to be part of someone's team. And it's the best way is actually to become part of someone's team. Someone's um, to perhaps do a PhD and then a postdoc and work with someone. And then um, with luck, you'll get the opportunity to branch out on your own and do your own research. That's only one type of, of biologists. Um, other biologists can go into practical conservation. Many, many, many biologists from, from school with biology, A, um, a levels or O levels or um, uh, a zoology degree um, go into organisations like the the National Trust, the Wildlife Trusts, and um, and put these things into practice. So there's a whole wide range of um, of um, opportunities. Amazing. They don't, all, they don't all pay very well. I should say. <laughs> That's the downside of going into yeah. ecology and studying what you love, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you have any anything that this young a zoologist could get stuck in with now um, while she's waiting to go to university? Or they, at, I should at, say. At, at what age is? I forget. I haven't got the... 12 no. is, is, 12 is, is what's well, written. Well, well, yes, because, I mean, sticking to the theme of butterflies, which I know best, the lovely thing about um, butterflies is the basic natural history of so many species. There are observations you can um, make just by rearing the caterpillars in captivity and watching what they're doing. Um, all the blue butterflies to some extent and the, the um, lysenids, that's the blues, the hair streaks and um, the coppers, uh, interact with ants, uh, sometimes only in the chrysalis stage. And there are, there are huge gaps in knowledge as to um, how they're behaving with ants, uh, really quite common species. Uh, and grass feeding butterflies, just watching which grass species they're uh, feeding on, if you can find them in the wild in the first place. If you've got a school teacher or a local um, natural history society or wildlife trust that um, has someone who can help you or, or a, a nearby university come to the, that and get, and get some caterpillars and rear them yourself, you can actually make in this field, unlike, for example, uh, particle physics, where uh, you need uh, multiple million pounds kit and high levels of training to even begin. Um, people, amateurs can do this in their backyard and make real breakthroughs uh, of, of, of many of our, our British butterflies, let alone the ones on the continent of Europe. Hmm. Wonderful, so you can get out there, get stuck in with nature and yeah. Take a look at what you find, really. And you can also record that on um, using citizen science, like uh, the Big Butterfly Count, for instance, um, which is launched by Butterfly Conservation, which will be running this summer, actually. So that's a really great way to get stuck in if you um, haven't come from a research background so far. Mm. So our next question comes from Rebecca. You mentioned Dartmoor a few times where you can see large blue butterflies. Now they, oh, sorry, I'll start that again. Um, you mentioned Dartmoor a few times. Where can we see large blue butterflies now they are reintroduced? Um, well, not Dartmoor, unfortunately. Uh, the story, the large blue story, is a very long and complicated one, and it did really well on. Well, it did well on Dartmoor for the first um, twenty-two generations from uh, nineteen eighty. Gosh, three, I think it was. But um, Dartmoor was always a, a suboptimal site. The soils are very thin, the populations were much smaller. It just happened to be the last place they survived because the pastoral old fashioned farming carried on longer there than anywhere else. Um, so uh, in the end, the National Trust who owned the sites decided it was um, uh, too much 
uh, uh, practical management to keep those colonies going, uh, it, it's much easier to achieve on the limestone sites actually in Somerset and um, the Cotswolds. Uh, so the places to see them now are um, in central Somerset, and there's a, a famous National Trust site called Collard Hill, um, and it's got a website, uh, and, and I, I hope there's a vlog up and running already, uh, which will tell you when they're out. I don't. Uh, I think they're only just out uh, on Collard. They're only just emerging now anywhere, uh, and only being seen on a very few sites. Um, 10 days or two weeks time is, is probably the time to really go. Uh, certainly in the Cotswolds, which tend to be a little later than the Somerset sites. Um, there's a, a, another site, although it's very difficult to park um, there, uh, is Somerset Wildlife Trust's uh, site of Greendown. Uh, and um, a site in the Cotswolds, if you're nearer to that, is Daneway Banks, which has a, a Pub, again, the, the, most of these sites are on the ends of very narrow roads and uh, parking is, is difficult and access is difficult and, and literally hundreds, many hundreds of people go to see it every year. So it has been a problem, uh, but Collard's got parking at a nearby um, youth, youth hostel, which uh, will is, is on the website directions. And Daneway has a pub at the bottom of the hill which one can use the car park as long as you use the pub as well, as long as you, um, it's, uh, uh, and they allow people to park there, as long as they have, have lunch at the pub uh, and, and utilize it. It's got rather a small car park, so it tends to be, to get crowded. Um, and uh, Daneway is a terrific place to see them, except as I said, it does get hundreds and hundreds of people at the peak of the season now. Um, but though, those are the three three main sites to go, and two of them only really cater for visitors. Green down doesn't. Perfect, thank you. So sort of almost got like a bit of a tourism um, buzz about it. These sites now, <laughs> everyone yeah. wants to see the infamous large blue. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I think for anyone who didn't get that, that was Collard Hill and Daneway Bank. I think Ed has just put a link in the description for us there. So our next question comes from Roger. How likely is it that colonies will survive without careful management? Um, not is the answer. Uh, it's, it's not quite as black and white as that. There are, are a few places where uh, I mentioned it needs the close grazing to get the heat. Actually, there are one or two places, if you go further, again, the story is much more complicated than I had time to give. If you go further south in Europe, where the um, spring and autumn temperatures are two or three degrees warmer um, than on average than in the UK, the ants still have a very narrow niche, but they're in taller grassland. And... Um, they actually don't lay their eggs on time. They lay their eggs on a very close relative, marjoram or origanum. Uh, and uh, in, in the UK, there are um, two or three sites that are artificial, um, artificial ones, uh, a railway cutting, for example, that has an exceptionally hot microclimate more similar to um, the, the climate in the Dordogne, central southern France, for example. And, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, there they are actually, the Myrmica sabulicea in taller turf, and they're actually laying their eggs on marjoram. So there are a handful of sites, but, <coughs> um, uh, without, but without any management, um, all the other ones would go uh, within two or three years. That applies to lots of other species of course as well um, uh, many many species all the species are doing well it's just the large blue is particularly sensitive it's it's sort of the tip of the iceberg um, uh, tip of the pyramid uh, but uh, no they wouldn't survive without sort of some sort of conservation management or any management you know I see and um, our next question um, is, do you have any suggestions for wild watching? I believe this is a follow-up question from 
before suggesting about getting involved with the butterfly count and and uh, sort of observational uh, watching of wildlife. Mm. Um, wildlife or butterflies or both. Uh, I mean, the the butterfly conservation schemes that you mentioned are are, are terrific. Uh, um, garden, the the big big garden count one thing. Or if you're a little bit more experienced, you can um, take part in butterfly butterfly transects, and they're a really good way of learning your butterflies and seeing them properly. And um, there's nearly always, I, I mean, the thing I do is to, uh, if you're sort of at the beginning end of the spectrum, uh, join the local branch of an organization such as Butterfly Conservation. There are uh, local branches all over the place and you'll find um, a number of people uh, who are, have got a good deal of experience who are normally only too delighted to help uh, newcomers introduce them, introduce them to some of the best sites in your county or your region or whatever. And that's true also of the wildlife trust. If you're, um, every county has got a wildlife trust, several wildlife trusts cover um, two, three, even four counties. Um, but if you, you don't have uh, if you join the wildlife trust or if you just um, take part in their activities they're all on the web um you'll you'll get introduced to a a, a wide range of of opportunities to see see wildlife on their local nature reserves or be taken on uh, walks or by experts local experts and um and that sort of thing and if your uh, birds are your main interest of course the rsbb is does exactly the same for birds. So there are a lot of opportunities now that now, now to uh, learn more through local people who, who are always only too keen to um, help beginners and uh, show them new places. Perfect, thank you. And if you are just starting out on your ID, I do recommend getting um, one of the Field Studies Council, just little um, pamphlet sort of guide, ID guide. They're really super handy, super portal, uh, portable as well. Um, and I think sometimes buying a book can seem a bit too heavy or I might not take that out as much. If you're just sort of, just learning your first steps of ID, those um, portable pamphlets are really, really handy, I find. And I think our last question comes from Roger. Um, how do the adults escape, escape from the ant's nest? Really good question, actually. I don't think we covered this. Ah, that's a very good question. Um, we don't completely know is the answer. They come out, they actually emerge very early in the morning uh, when the ants are quite quiescent. Uh, and they do make a lot of those noise, but they do make a lot of those noises, which winds the ants up quite a bit when they're breaking out of the um, pupil case. Uh, but now perhaps that may that may be all then in that case um thank you so much jeremy it's been incredible listening to that story and your um, knowledge of the large blue is inevitably endless uh, <laughs> i feel very enriched on its story i have to say um and what a what a wonderful way to round off our researchers story series um thank you so much once again for, for joining us today Thank you all once again for coming. Um, it's been really, really special. So thank you, guys. I'll give you all guys a moment to leave.